Gays that don't do drag love to be like, I just know I would eat on RuPaul's drag. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Every gay guy thinks he could win Drag Race. Every straight guy thinks he could do stand up. And women need to gain more confidence. You're a boy. Yes, I'm a boy. You're a boy stuck in a girl's body. Yes. Okay. Wait, really? That's it? Yeah, that's it. Is there anything else that I need to know? Just like that. You just accept me just like that? Yeah, why? Are you, like, lying to me or something? No, no, I'm not lying. I'm not lying at all. Okay. So, then, you say you're a boy. I am gonna take you literally. You are a boy. Do you need any more information? I don't know. Is there something that's gonna, like, personally involve me, or...? No. Okay, so... Can we go back to playing Spider-Man now? I'm not good at all. Yes. Okay, let's try to not have any more interruptions. The truth has been revealed. It is true, I'm a member of an alien species called the Transformers also known as the transgenders. Us transgenders used to live in peace and tranquility on our home planet, Transylvania, where we love to dance and to sing. One day, disaster struck and our world was thrown into chaos when our sacred cube of hormones was ejected into outer space where it landed on a foreign planet called Earth. This is what started the hormone wars. We had to fight each other for the last remaining hormones. While we were fighting, we didn't realize that the humans of Earth were using our sacred cube for their own advantages. Once we realized this, we stopped our petty fighting and we crash landed into Earth so that one day we may take back our sacred cube. We have used our own advanced technologies to perfectly disguise ourselves as humans. It's only a matter of time before we get our revenge. <laughs> take my estrogen. <laughs> published to the American Psychological Association Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. Oh, Kate, that's, that's, that's great news. Fantastic, amazing, so great for you, wifey. <laughs> what was it about? It was about how men feel worse about themselves when female partners succeed. Uh huh. that, that's fascinating. I never would have guessed that in a million empirical studies. <laughs> I imagine that uh, women's self-esteem also takes a hit. No, actually, not at all. You would assume that a man might feel threatened if his girlfriend outperformed him in something that they're doing together, like, like publishing research, like losing weight. Yeah, that. But we found evidence that men automatically interpret a partner's success as their own failure, even when they're not in direct competition. Well, I mean, can you really tell that off of one? We studied 896 people across five experiments. E yeah, well, if you're studying Americans, that makes sense, given the cultural and gender bias. Two of those studies were done in the Netherlands. Oh, yeah. 
Because the Netherlands boasts one of the smallest gender gaps in labor education and politics. Smart. <laughs> exactly. The men there said they felt fine about their partner's success, but the implicit self-esteem test that we did revealed otherwise. Wow, yeah. Surprising find- uh, very surprising findings. What did, uh, what, what, what did, uh, what, uh, I'm sure the basis of the achievements have some influence? Oh no, it didn't matter if the achievements were social, intellectual, or even related to the men's own successes or failures. Oh. Men subconsciously felt worse about themselves when their partner succeeded. Oh. And their self-esteem took an even bigger hit if the women succeeded at something that they themselves had failed at. What? <laughs> what? 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 Is... <laughs> what? Why? Hmm. You know, I think it's because ambition and success are qualities generally important to women selecting mates. So men were worried that their partners may trade up for someone better. Like Gottman. What? What? Nothing. No, congratulations, babe. That is really great news, and I celebrate your success as my own. Aw, thanks, babe. Oh, it was also really interesting. We found that women felt optimistic about the future of their relationships when a partner had success, where the men felt pessimistic. You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting to see a similar study done of gay couples. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe I'll pivot my research as well. To what, babe? You know, maybe I'll start uh, looking at the ways to deconstruct the patriarchy, you know? The ways we teach gender bias in this country. The toxic stereotypes we hold men to that lead to this internal feeling of failure. That's amazing. I love you so much. I love you too. Now get back out there and do more studies and get them published or not. <laughs> you know, failure is, is a part of success. Ugh, I'm so glad you're not one of the statistical men from my studies, babe. Good luck, babe. I'm so glad you actually care about my success as a woman and my career, even though we have the same field of research that we're doing. Thank you so much for not being threatened at all by my successes. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. I wanted to speak to all the advocates that follow me, all the disability advocates, the Palestinian advocates, the Sudanese advocates, the people from the DRC, everyone that is advocating for a better future for themselves, their people, society at large, while simultaneously feeling like the world is crumbling around you. The goal is to preserve the lives of your family, your friends, your community, the goal is life itself. But given that the goal is life itself, you also get to live it. And hear me out, and please hear this in the spirit in which it is given. It's okay to feel all of it. And maybe this is a message to myself too, because I'm the same way. You smile hard only to remember the work and then your smile falters. Or you stop yourself from crying and screaming because you feel like it takes away from the work. But if you're going to do this work, as so many people are, you get to live and exist in every single emotion that comes to you. You get to experience joy, and it doesn't take away from the work. You get to experience bone-wracking sadness and grief and despair, and it will not take away from the work. And it's okay to feel everything you're feeling, and it will not take away from the work. You may be an advocate, but you are also a human being. And if your goal is to preserve the lives of everyone around you, life itself, you get to live it too. However that manifests. So don't extinguish your widest smiles and don't stop yourself from feeling your grief. Because at the very least, one of the lives you're fighting for, to live to its fullest, with everything that encompasses that, is your own. Happy Valentine's Day, darlings. I think one of the main reasons people think nonfiction is boring is because they don't know that nonfiction authors can be just as talented or more talented than a lot of fiction authors. Like they think nonfiction just tends to be like textbooks or really boring like history. And some of the best writers out there are nonfiction authors. So here's 10 of the best written books that I have ever read in my life and exactly why I love their writing.
The reason I'm making this is because I'm currently reading Leslie Jameson's new book, Splinters, and I am just like in love with her writing because it's so unpredictable in the ways that like a lot of authors develop a somewhat formulaic pattern to how they write and how they vary up sentence structures. And this is just like with each word and with each phrase, it's something new and unique and it's just so beautiful to read something and you don't know what the next emotion or what the next thought is going to bring and it's just mesmerizing. All Down Darkness Wide is a memoir about being in love with someone that is battling severe depression. It's something that just like emotionally washes over you time and time again. And the way that it's written has this really unique styling of kind of like lulling you into something and then dropping the floor out from under you. It's just, it's so heart-wrenching and it's so well done. Mickey Kendall's hood feminism is infectiously expressive, but also endearingly informative. Like every single thought that goes into this book is told with such like acuity and authority and also just a poignancy that is hard to escape. I think this one feels like something that is just like one of the best written books, but also one of the most informative books. It's also one of the books that like will help you feel so much confidence as a reader. And it's it's something that I think everyone should read. They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us by Hanif Abdurraqib is my favorite book of all time. And it's because of this book's ability to capture emotion, not only with expressing that emotion to you and making you feel and think in ways that feel so genuine and so empathetic and so like all consuming but it's also the author living through emotions that I don't think I'm capable of living through like I don't think I have the emotional weight to ever even write something like this let alone have the language to do it it's just it's astounding Reading Heavy was one of the most grounding experiences that I've ever had as a reader. I felt totally present, not only in the stories, but also in the thoughts of the author and in the moment of reading it. It just felt like something that was totally captured in its completeness. And it was, it's just something that's so unique because the author has such an incredible ability to write in these short bursts of sentences that feel almost simplistic, but are so incredibly varied and so incredibly insightful. The Viral Underclass by Stephen Thrasher is a book that has movement. It has an ability to dance between things that are personal, things that are scientific, things that are journalistic, and the ability to move seamlessly in between those states of writing and storytelling and narrative is just, I mean, it's just one of those things that if this was like the standard type of writing that comes with science writing, uh, no one would find it to be intimidating, ever. Whatever words that I could find to express how much command that James Baldwin has over language, and not only just like the written word, but his tone and his vibrancy, it would it would seem like hyperbolic, but it's not. If you've never watched him speak, go look up some of his interviews on YouTube and you'll just be just absolutely mesmerized. I'm using No Name on the Street because it's a personal favorite of mine, but if you pick up any books by James Baldwin, they're all the same. They're all just astounding. It is just... It, there's really no one else like him. Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass is a book that if I had to describe in one word, it would be serene. I, I think it's just one of those things that all of the emotions expressed in this book and all of the emotions felt while reading the writing, not only about like topics that are informational, but also the emotional resonance of this story is just something that is like, there's just a transcendent calmness with this that is hard to escape and is completely deserved. Like it's just, it's one of those things that I think whether you do the audiobook or whether you read this book, it'll just put you into a place of like almost tranquility. Naomi Klein as an author, but especially in her new book, Doppelganger, is a book that I would describe not as repetitive, but as continuously beating you. And it's it's so fascinating in the ways that she not only like constructs the ideas, but also formats the sentences, that it's just, it's like a hammer in blacksmithing. It's just continuously pounding and shaping the object, and the object is you as the reader, and it's just... It's a wonderful and violent experience that is also done with such accuracy and such commitment that it, you just you will just like kind of fall in love with not only just the thoughts of this person, but also the ways that these thoughts are conveyed. This last one feels like cheating on my part because Still Life with Bones by Alexa Haggerty is a book in which I read sentences in this book 
and just had to take a pause because I could not believe how a sentence was structured and not only its tone, but its emotion and its like linguistic qualities. I like it's it's almost where you, you start reading it and you're not sure you're speaking the same language as the author. I've really never read something quite like this where I had these feelings early on in the book where I thought I was reading a bad book and almost instantly when it clicked that this was just something almost otherworldly did I really like understand that I was reading just something wholly unique in its style and its tone and its emotional compactness it's just I, I wish I could tell you more but I really like I still don't know what the fuck I read The trans people on TikTok aren't going to tell you the bad parts. Your singing voice is going to be gone. You're not going to be able to sing at all. Every time you sing, it's just going to crack and hurt. Yes, there were times I'm sure you knew When I beat off more than I could chew But through it all, when there was doubt, I hated it My share of losing But now As tears subside I find it all So amusing <laughs> To think I did all that And may I say Not in a shy way Oh no, not me. There you go. I've been on testosterone for two years. <laughs> I just thought I would throw that in.